Good morning, everyone. Maybe I'll do a sound check for those of you on Zoom. How's the sound this morning? Can you hear me okay? Great. It's nice to have everyone here. We'll probably wait another minute or two to get started just to make sure everybody has a chance to show up. So this is a good time to uh, use our imagination. Probably have about 30 people or so on uh, the Zoom community. And for those on Zoom, we have about 12 or so people in the room practicing this morning, all day long, hopefully. I mentioned earlier for people in the room, um, I have some of the uh, schedules here. I sent it out yesterday. Some of you probably got the email with it. And you don't really need the schedule because I'll walk us all through it during the day, but some people just like to see it and there's extra copies here. So if you need to, and there's one sitting on the little table in the lobby too. So again, for those of you who are on Zoom, you probably noticed that I've spotlighted myself and uh, we're recording um, just by, that's our habit, just to record everything. And uh, uh, you can always choose to have a gallery view in your upper right if you wanna see people who are on the Zoom meeting with you. But this way that only my video will get recorded It's nice, I always say something like this at the beginning of a retreat, whether it's a nine day retreat or a half day retreat or today's day long retreat. We're following in the footsteps of so many people before us who had busy lives and duties and responsibilities and not easily, right? But we put aside our responsibilities for the day. We've shut our cell phones off. <laughs> Make sure if you haven't already, those at home, you might even have the great privilege to put your phone in a drawer for the day. Because it's really just an interesting exploration to see if we can be free of that, uh, you know, all that our connection through the internet, through the virtual world, all that that means to us. Like, can I, on purpose, making a choice, just put it that aside. And we can check it again later in the afternoon, of course. Because the work where we do when we have these retreats, it's really turning inward. A lot of people misunderstand, like they think, oh, so the Buddha, the Buddhist plan, the Buddhist teachings are only about looking inward. But it's really correcting an imbalance. It's really more about an integration. And because we live so out of balance, you know how it is. We're constantly pulled into our thoughts about things. And sometimes we do that collectively, we're in conversation, and sometimes it's just within our own mind. And there's no context then, because it's so obsessive, there's no context to being lost in thought. 
So what do I mean by like an appropriate context? Like the co- knowing the experience of the mind, of the heart, when it's not caught, not bound by our thoughts about things. Some of you know Ajahn Sumedho. He's one of our elders in the Western Dharma. He practiced in Thailand in the 60s and early 70s, and then came to the West, started some monasteries. So he's a Buddhist monk in the Thai forest tradition. Still alive, although he's quite old now, late 80s or mid to late 80s, I think. Having been a monk for, you know, I think it's, getting close to 50 years now. And um, yeah, just, uh, I forget the the quote that I was gonna mention about from Ajahn Sumedho, but just this predicament that we're in, this sort of mistrust of the simple empty space of the present moment. Oh, I remember now, it's just, he had this little, teaching that he'd give his students because, you know, even when we're sitting, even when we're following the breath, I'm sure you've noticed there's a lot of thought. (laughs) And so just that invitation, well, instead of constructing another thought, like I shouldn't be thinking so much, which is just adding on to the mind's addiction to its thoughts about things, he would recommend just notice however slight it is, just notice the little gap between one thought and the next. Just as a way of growing confidence in the space of the present moment. So we have the activity of the present moment. That means the activity of our thoughts, the activity of our sensations, the activity of emotion and other feelings that are coming and going the activity of sounds that are being heard. And this is the world we know, and this is the world that we're obsessively attentive to, all this activity. And then the basic problem is that comes to be the only world that is known. So Ajahn Sumedho's teacher in Thailand, a Thai, very famous Thai monk, died in the 90s, Ajahn Cha. Ajahn just means teacher. So his monastic name was Cha, C-H-A-H. He's quite well known in Thailand. And he's also somewhat in the West, especially in our early Buddhist tradition that Common Ground is part of. He's kind of one of our important elders who you know lived in the last hundred years. And uh, it just this, this necessity of um, integration between the activity and the space, the still empty space of the present moment. And he used the simile, Ajahn Chah used the simile of still flowing water as a kind of koan. I mean, koans aren't in this early Buddhist tradition. That's in the Renzai Zen tradition, but you know, a koan, as much as I understand it, it's just a phrase that the mind holds and reflects on and kind of uh, stumps the mind. So what he would say is, have you ever seen still water? And of course, most of us would say, yeah, like a pond that no apparent current, very still like glass, right? We've probably seen a body of water like that. And then he goes, Ajahn Chah would say, well, have you ever seen flowing water? You know, and most of us would say, yeah, I've seen a little stream or river flowing along. And then he'd, here's the stump, here's the koan. Have you ever seen still flowing water? And all of us would probably think, what the hell does he mean? (laughs) You know. And then he uses that as a simile for our present moment experience or the experience of the mind. There's something that's here and now, it's not philosophical, it's here and now, actual, that's, that that simile still flowing water points to. And it's, here's the kicker, 
it's the not knowing what a simile like that points to that is the cause for us being ordinary neurotic human beings. Because we know the flowing part of the present moment because we're obsessively attentive to that. What is this person doing in the room next to me? You know, Or just the thought, should I be here today? A whole day of practice, I'm not so sure. You know, Or just the movement of sensation, the movement of achiness in our knees or in our back, or the movement of Mark's words, the movement of my thoughts about Mark's words. And we know that world of movement, of activity, and we talk about it in the Buddhist tradition in terms of the six sense gates, right? We have the activity of sensation, of sound, of sight, smell, taste. So the five physical senses are always in motion, some more dominant than the others, right? And then we have the activity of mental activity, the activity of thinking and emoting. And that's everything through these six sense doors, that's our whole life. There's nothing outside of knowing experienced in these six ways, some combination of these six ways. So that's practice, right? That's often how we understand mindfulness practice is to be mindfully aware of these activities and to learn to be okay with the movement of sensation like the breath, or bodily sensations or the movement of thought or sound and sight and the movement of thought. But that whole practice of being at ease, clearly aware, continuity of mindfulness with all this activity is actually setting us up for the deepening of insight into what isn't moving. Right now, for a lot of us, it's theoretical, like, I'm interested in what the Buddha means by the still part. I know the flowing part, but I'm not so sure I know what that still part that he's pointing to. And we have ways we talk about it like the empty, silent, still space of the present moment. And we use the image like of the space of this room. All kinds of activity could go on. We could have Zumba class in this room or something, some ecstatic dance class. But the space of the room, not, not the walls, which are in, in a way active in their slow deterioration, you know, everything, even things that are relatively static, like this little stool is actually in motion. But the space, the essential space of the room is a nice metaphor for that stillness that's here and now, that's available, accessible, recognizable here and now. But obviously it's subtle. So that kind of helps us understand what we're gonna do today. We have two primary tasks. One, and this is the more obvious of the two, but not necessarily easy, one is, you know, as we settle in, because we've simplified our schedule, we're here either at the center or in your space at home. We have this day, the cell phones are off. Presumably we have a relatively comfortable place to sit and walk and just be for the day. And the first thing we're gonna notice is how much activity there is, you know, all the reverberations from earlier in the week that are still rattling around in our hearts, worries and hopes and anger and <clears throat> upsets from the unfinished business of the week and of our life, right? So we have all that kind of emotional stuff that might be churning, worries about the world, whatever. And then we have the, you know, the hunger and the attractions and the repulsions and the likes and the dislikes. And we have to learn how to be exposed to the activity of the moment without 
reacting in ways that cause the heart, body, mind to get tight. That's a big part of our practice, isn't it? It's just like, it's not even the question like, should I be experiencing what I'm experiencing? It's, I am experiencing what I'm experiencing. So what's the best way to be relating to it? To be in denial that there's all this activity, to be constantly thinking it's my responsibility to fix what's moving right now in my mind, in the terms of sound, in terms of sight. Somehow I am responsible for managing all of the activity of the present moment and steering it in the direction of where I want it to go. Well, you can try that. That's sort of what we do try most of life, making the conditions, the circumstances, the activity the way we want it to be. So that will be a lot of what we're doing today is we'll settle and with whatever clarity, whatever stability of awareness there is, we'll notice how much is emotion and we'll notice how much reactivity we have to what's in motion. And then we'll learn a thing or two like how the reactivity to what's in motion just adds stress and being peaceful, being at ease, being accepting, being curious with what's in motion is less stressful. So that whole realm of learning, we call like learning what's skillful and unskillful. Given that we have a human life, a human mind, a human body, a human community, you know, given that we have a life, all this activity, what's the best way to be relating? And here we, you know, it's nice that we have teachings, but even if we didn't have any teachings, just through trial and error, we'd learn a thing or two about how to be a sensitive human being exposed to all this activity. So as we get, you know, some momentum, some skill, get better at relating to all the activity in the moment, then it's like the wisdom in the heart begins to see through all the activity and begins to intuit the stillness, the empty, silent, peaceful, open space, space of love, space of wisdom. We don't talk too much about that, except in terms of giving the mind some encouragement to be interested. And in a way, I was just reading an article by a Western Buddhist monk, Tanisaro, done a lot of the translations that we use and just a very prolific scholar and Dharma teacher. He uh, is the abbot of a monastery outside of San Diego. He's an American, but also studied in Thailand with some of the Thai forest masters before coming back to the West and teaching. And um, yeah, just that, uh, that importance of being interested in, you know, the, what's not moving. And we have to, I was reading an article this morning and uh, how we, we have to like this heart, heartwood is a simile that the Buddha used that as humans, we're often just seems like just getting to the twigs would be enough, but actually we need some kind of refuge because whatever twigs we get, you know, superficial stuff, superficial pleasures, it kind of lasts, but we're always hunger for, hungry for more, doesn't really satisfy. And the Buddha says something really provocative that there's an end to suffering. And it doesn't require not being a human being like if only I didn't exist, or if only I weren't here, or if only things weren't the way they are. So this making peace with all the activity of the present moment is the beginning. It's sort of the setup for a deepening of insight into what the Buddha's teachings point to, this <clears throat> third noble truth. You know, there is suffering, that's the first. There is this fundamental 
unsatisfactory nature of being a sensitive human being. Have you noticed? There's a cause for that pervasive unsatisfactoriness. And there's an ending and there's a path. Those are the four teachings that <clears throat> kind of is one of the ways of summing up what the Buddha taught about for 45 years. There is this truth of dukkha. It has a cause. There is an ending. That's the provocative thing. Because it really seems to us, I guess, in a somewhat nihilistic way, that human life is a setup. And the best we can hope for is to have relatively nice conditions to get ourselves through it. And we, sometimes we don't even want to hear this teaching that there's an end to suffering because that means I have to be responsible for checking it out. And we've been betrayed a lot by thinking something's going to really change, like falling in love with someone. That's, and then we realize that yeah, was nice or whatever it was, but it didn't really resolve the problem of human life or have kid, having kids or getting a dog or taking a nice vacation or any number of things that are relatively big in our life. Growing up, you know, when we were young, we thought, yeah, God, just can't wait to be out of the house, you know, on my own. But that didn't do it for us, did it? So we're, we're a little skeptical when somebody like the Buddha says there's an end to suffering. But I can't really, whatever I say isn't going to do it for you. You got to check it out for yourself. You got to actually undertake the practice of noticing how much activity there is getting profoundly sensitive and learning not to be in a reactive state to what's moving in terms of your thoughts, in terms of your emotions, in terms of sounds and sensations. We, le we need to learn how to be at ease, clearly aware and relaxed. So we'll be doing that. That will be feel, like I said, the primary work, I guess we could say of our day. But when we have some momentum in moments when we do feel pretty spacious and at ease with whatever's moving in us, around us. That's the time to, in a sense, bring up the Buddhist teachings. There is an end to suffering. There is an experience of the heart, the mind, free of grasping. Something is here and now. And the point that uh, Ajahn Tani Saro uh, uh, made rather in this article that I mentioned was that freedom doesn't depend on you or me doing something. What we do in our practice is we're abandoning the distortions and we're abandoning the disinterest in this, you could say, essential truth that's here and now. Something's here and now that resolves the issue of my heart being bound up. But it has to be experienced directly. And it's really okay, actually, in some ways, it's very appropriate, appropriate for us to have doubt like, does the Buddha know what he's talking about? Or is that just a bunch of religious hooey? I mean, it's, that's actually, uh, but what is relevant is, should I check it out? Just in case the Buddha knew what he was talking about. And the thing is, all the way along, you know, when we check out the Buddhist teachings, like the initial teaching, realize how much activity there is in any moment, and realize how much we react to the activity in ways that are stressful and realize you can not do that. <laughs> you know, we don't have to get tight just because there's a disturbing sound from a car outside, or we don't have to hate things because the room's too cold for us or my back hurts. It doesn't help to get tight because of what's moving in the present moment. 
It doesn't help to hate it. It doesn't help to promise yourself that if only I get rid of this, then I'll be happy. Because all of those reactive ways of greed, hatred, and delusion just compound the stress. And then we, we get a taste like, oh yeah, that's really true. You know, like we check that part of the Buddhist teachings out and we get a little confidence like, maybe this guy knows what he's talking about. And then we're interested in some of the more subtle things that we haven't yet tasted or intuited or realized deeply. Like there is an end to suffering and the end of suffering doesn't depend on you or me getting to some place called heaven. You know, it's so provocative in the Buddhist cosmology. You know, they have these ideas of heaven, right? Angelic or celestial beings, beings of light, very beautiful, pleasant conditions, but they're still caught in this wheel. And it's a little bit like our human society, you know, we have people who have really good fortune and they've got beautiful bodies and wealth and people like them and you know and then we have people who have seemingly more difficulties than anybody deserves one thing after another and it's a little bit but when we you know because we're that person sometimes sometimes our conditions it's like we're in heaven somebody loves us we love them body feels good we got the food we like to eat in the refrigerator and sometimes life is like hell. But even when things are really good, there's a uneasiness or a subtle being bound up in our heart, right? Even when things are really good. So this freedom isn't about getting to really good conditions. And it's not that really nice conditions are bad, obviously. If we can be free from pain and illness, that's better. If we can have harmonious relationships with the people we live around and with, better. So these relative things really matter. But if we stake our happiness on just getting conditions better, that's stressful because we know whether we're honest with ourselves or not, we know we're vulnerable to those conditions changing. And we know we're not in perfect control of the circumstances and conditions in our lives. So the Buddha realized that and he went looking like spiritual seekers have before and after the Buddha. Well, what's a way to find real safety that's not conditioned? And this is what the Buddha realized in many, many, you know, who knows how many, but lots of lots of people have realized the same thing the Buddha has realized. And even sort of a lot of our teachers, you know, I put myself in this group too, have deeply experienced some of what the Buddha deeper teachings are pointing to, that freedom, that unconditioned freedom that isn't a matter of isn't dependent on conditions. And I'm guessing other people in the room have whatever amount of taste, intuition of that in your own practice, in your own life. And that's what keeps us coming back to these two tasks, right? We have still or flowing, still water or still flowing water. And we have to learn how to bring these two together. So like, it's almost like uh, I was talking to my partner, Win Fricky, who's also a teacher here and the co-founder of Common Ground. Although Win has a full-time job, so she doesn't teach as much here as I do, but uh, Win walked me to the center. We don't live too far away this morning. And we were talking about this, you know, and, and we we're kind of joking with each other, like, you know, walking all dressed, bundled up because it's cold out. And we were talking, so lots of activity, walk into the center, but just like how to be empty, empty space, voidness is a kind of interesting word that's used sometimes, how to be fully human with a personality, with likes and dislikes, with a body, 
in motion, engaged, and empty at the same time. And that's really the heart of it. And that's that deeper insight. It's like, first we have to realize how much is in motion. And as we make peace with that, as we become more skillful with everything that's moving, then whatever insights we have into the empty nature that this amazing activity of the present moment doesn't refer back or it's being held by this vast void. You know, these things, these words are pointing to a actual experience. So don't expect the words to be anything that we can grasp or understand intellectually. They're just meant to be, to sort of support interest in the actuality of our subjective space as a human being, like what's here and now for us, not what's here and now theoretically, but our own space. So as we're sitting today, as we're walking, eating our lunch, talking together at times, just keep coming back to, can I be aware of the activity of the present moment? What else is here and now besides all this activity? And like I said, what's that empty space between a thought and the next thought? Well, what's, what's the nature of the space in which all this activity is happening? So just before I end this talk, this morning talk, and we'll stretch and then do a sit, but let's just check right now, you know, and again, we don't need a particular posture or we just have to be interested in our own subjective experience, what's here and now. And it doesn't require thought, but thoughts can't ruin it either. So you don't need to be anti-thought. And thoughts can be useful as a kind of jumping off point for the contemplation, for the reflection. But what might a wise person like Ajahn Chah mean by still flowing water, right? It's a phrase that is meant to be helpful in terms of us sensing what's here and now that we haven't yet clearly sensed. So just check that out for a few seconds together. And the more we have an intuitive sense of stillness or space, the more we see the activity of the present moment as this activity of nature, not so personal. And the more we see the activity of the thoughts and sensations as nature and not self, the more the mind intuits or wisdom intuits the vast empty space of the present moment. And it's like, that's the engine of awakening. Spacious relationship to the activity deepens the insight into the empty space, open space of the present moment. The more that's intuitive, the more the mind's relationship to the activity is one of acceptance, non-grasping, the more of that, the more that intuitive space of freedom, the more freedom, the more we can just dance freely with all the circumstances, all the engagements, all the doings that we have to do. We're not afraid, less fear, more love, really. Time for one or two questions before we stretch and get ready for a first sit. Anything about what I've said this morning from those of you online or people in the room you can just unmute yourself or raise your digital hand if you're in the Zoom community. Otherwise, just let me know in the room if you have any 
question about anything not clear in terms of what I said. Well, let's just stand for a moment, each of us. We can just stretch in a way that feels right. And then when you're ready, after a minute or two, just find a comfortable sitting posture for yourself. And make sure you have what you need to be able to sit comfortably for about 35 minutes. And as you're settling, listen to the body, making adjustments. And another nice ritual is simply to do a few longer, deeper breaths. I like to think about this little ritual as a, a simple act of love, you know, giving the body what it really needs, which is a nice meal of oxygen by slowly in a relaxed way, filling the lungs and then slowly in a relaxed way, emptying the lungs and to do that a few times. And then it's just an easy way to have a more open and intimate awareness of the whole body. And again, just a simple act of kindness. And as you feel more relaxed, you can even slow it down a, a bit more. Simply noticing how this deep breathing feels. Appreciate the pleasure of it. And even when life is really difficult, it's nice to know that we can do this one simple, wholesome thing. We can feed the body a little bit more oxygen. We can do this simple act of kindness of simply breathing in in a relaxed way and filling the lungs. Breathing out in a relaxed way, consciously emptying the lungs. So maybe try it one more time. We have as much time in the world as we need. And whenever you're done, simply let the breathing continue on its own knowing that you don't have to manage the breathing process. Instead, we allow ourselves to have more of this receptive stance or position, almost as an observer, a witness to all the activity coming and going. And we can ground this present moment awareness with the activity of the body, sensation. Noticing that the body is alive with sensation, 
quite diverse, pleasant, unpleasant, lots of neutral sensations coming and going. You might say just being aware of the energy of the body and how alive with change it is. And being aware, being intimate for its own sake, I'm not trying to get anywhere or make something happen, but simply or knowing simply that it's wholesome to be present, open to the body. And you can coordinate this body awareness with the breath. So while breathing in, experiencing the whole body just as it is, while breathing out, allowing all the sensations to be. And as I mentioned, we're beginning the sit by learning how to be both intimate and allowing all the activity. <clears throat> And we're starting with the activity of bodily sensations. Simply <clears throat> keeping the body in mind. Doing this one half breath at a time. That makes it doable. Of course, we're going to feel the impulse many, many times to want to fix, want to manage, want to get away from some of the activity that we're experiencing, whether it's sensation or some thoughts that have shown up or some emotion. But remember, first and foremost, now we're learning how to recognize and accept all the activity, starting with the body, but including any other activity that becomes predominant at any point in the set. Just this understanding, now it's like this. This is moving here in the heart, in the mind, in the body, whatever. This is moving now. It's like this now. Feels like this now. Can this be okay that my life, this life is moving like this? This is the flowing water of my life. Following, lawfully following all the causes and conditions can't be otherwise. Can this be okay? Is it safe to relax and allow and to feel?
And if, in, if at any time it's not easy to be with the movement of the breath and the movement of sensation in the body, then you can just ask, well, what is moving? What's predominant in emotion right now? Is it emotion itself or a thought? Some seemingly fixed idea? Some reaction? What's in motion now? Let me notice this as an activity, something that's changing, coming and going, so that I can make peace with the flowing nature of the present moment. And when we can, we'll notice the still, open, silent space. You could call it the space of wisdom. It's here and now, like a beautiful mirror that simply reflects back. And the more we intuit the still and silent space of the knowing mind, the easier it is to accept all the activity that's coming and going, pleasant and unpleasant, and of course, neutral. So let's continue now in silence.
And let's be willing to begin again and again. There is this activity here and now, bodily activity, sounds being heard, sights being seen, thoughts being thought. And there's some empty, open, vast, silent space at the present moment in which all this activity is coming and going. And is it possible to keep both in mind to relating, to be relating to both with awareness, non-attachment,
And remembering again, keeping in mind both this activity of sensation, of thought, sound, but also learning how to keep in mind the sense of the space, the knowing space of the present moment, the space of the open awareness, that remains in a sense unstained, unaffected by what comes and goes. So we'll sit for another two or three minutes. And without rushing, of course, just uh, begin to adjust, stretch, whatever feels helpful. So we'll do some walking practice in about five minutes, but I just want to make sure that uh, there's no questions about the instructions and about the general theme for today, activity and stillness. And we don't really, can't really have a sense of stillness without really making peace with the activity of what's ever happening in the moment. And the more we intuit the still, open, empty space of the present moment, the more we can, we'll be okay with the activity emotions, thoughts. But if all we know is activity, then we're going to take it personally. And we'll prefer some activity of the mind to other activity of some emotions to other emotions, some circumstances to others. So any questions or comments about the sitting time? 
And if not, I'll introduce the walking practice. Good, and we'll have discussion time before lunch. Um, so for walking, um, we'll have about a half an hour. We'll come back at 11.15 here, Minnesota time. I put the schedule, by the way, in the chat for those of you who are online. And I mentioned for those in the room here, we've got some extra copies up front. And uh, we'll have a sit from, let's say 11.15 to 11.45. It's a little different. It says 11.10 here, but we'll go start the sit at 11.15. So come back at 11.15. So during that 30 minutes, I'll explain to the people in the room after we, uh, I explain for folks at home, but obviously it's the same. Find a place to walk for 30 minutes. For those of you at home, it might be you do two or three laps around your block. If you live in a place where a block, it's nice not to have to think too much about where you're walking. Well, you might walk in one direction for 12 or 13 minutes and turn around and walk back. Same with those of you in the neighborhood here. Uh, those in the room, you know, we have a park one block north here, Matthews Park, and the Greenway is one block south. I would walk toward the river to the left if you go down to the Greenway. And you could do that, just walk 13 minutes, come back 13 minutes, gives you time to take your boots off, things like that. But really what we're doing, and, and I'll mention to those here how we'll walk in the space if you don't want to go outside in just a moment. So whether you find a place at home to walk or you walk outside, the practice is the same. Initially, put most of the attention on all the activity. So just the the obvious placing, 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 right? That's a real obvious activity coming and going in the present moment, noticing each step as the foot connects with the earth and then the next and the next. And if you're walking more slowly, you can notice a few points like the moment of lifting, the moments of moving forward, the moments of dropping and pressing in. So depends on the pace, you know, you might just know, have one sort of moment of knowing for each step, or you might have several moments of knowing for each step, just depending on the speed and the sensitivity. But that's just the activity. And then at times, even when you're with that activity, the physicality of walking, it will get interrupted with the activity of thinking worrying, am I doing it right? Or whatever it is. I mean, it could be, you know, an infinite number of thoughts and planning mind and worrying mind and fantasizing mind. But our job is more activity. Oh, this is the activity of the thinking mind. And if there's a feeling and emotion associated with the thinking, oh, this is the activity of emotion. There's a feeling that is moving like a river through the sensitive heart. So just keep normalizing the activity. When in doubt, turn the attention towards what's more prominent and neutral, like the physicality of walking. And then when other activities are predominant, they kind of come into the forefront of attention, then let them. Okay, now this is the activity that's being known. And this is how we normalize and make peace with the activity of the present moment. And the more we do that, then naturally we'll intuit the open, empty. When you know, when we use that word empty, we mean the mind, the heart that is empty of reactivity, empty of greed, empty of fear, empty of irritation. So that neutral, open, unreactive, non-reactive space. That's in a sense, aware of this activity, all these rivers of activity. And then when you get some momentum, you can go, you can see how both are true. There's all this activity and there's this empty space, open space, silent space that isn't having a problem with all this activity. And the activity could be even really painful or disgusting or, you know, 
some activity that would normally get a real reaction, but there's something that's unaffected, not, not having a problem, and that's here and now. And that's what we want to intuit. But you can't force it. Just mostly, most of the emphasis is on recognizing all the activity and being okay about it. Just letting life rip. Thoughts can rip, emotions can rip, sensations can rip, sounds can rip, especially if you're outside, you know, there's so much activity internally and in our thoughts about things, but just be aware of it as activity. This is the nature, everything's in motion and it's okay. Can it be okay? Let me see, yeah, I can relax with this. I can allow this, letting everything move. Okay, so we'll come back at 11.15 for the next sitting period. Have a good walking practice, everyone. So we'll be getting started with our next sitting period in just a few moments. So make sure you have what you need. Again, we'll sit for about 30 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. We'll have one more walking period and then we'll come back for a little discussion time before we take a lunch break. And this meditation period will be in silence. I won't be giving any instruction.
And again, for the last minute or so, just curious about what's in motion in the mind, in the heart, in the body, and the room around us. And what is the refuge that allows the mind to be settled and clear and unafraid with everything that's in motion? So we'll do about 20 minutes of walking. Again, just find a place where you can continue this contemplation of the present moment, what's in motion, what has the nature of being open, aware, and unaffected really by the drama of our minds, the drama of what's going on around us still flowing water. We'll come back at 10 minutes after 12 Minnesota time. We'll have a little practice discussion for 15 minutes, see what reflections people have or questions. We'll have our lunch break, about an hour and a half or hour and 20 minutes, something like that, depending when we're done and come back for our afternoon practice. So I'll see everybody in about 20 minutes. We'll take about 10 or 15 minutes and reflect on what we've learned this morning and questions that have emerged. And uh, then before we end, I'll just say a little bit about how to use the break time so that we continue the practice even while we take a lunch break. But first, any questions that have come up for you about the instructions or just more generally about the Buddhist teachings? Also, any reflections you've had in the walking practice, learnings, challenges, or in the sitting practice? And it looks like Mary, you want to start us off, Mary? Let me just uh, turn the volume up here so that everyone in the room here at the meditation said, okay, go ahead, Mary. My question is this. I've been reflecting a lot in the last week or a week and a half or so about Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings, um, given his death and been reading and all these things. And um, I wonder, I have very little, I'm very uncomfortable in my own stillness. <laughs> <laughs> I've rushed and rushed and rushed for my whole life. Um, and my brain just goes and goes, goes and my emotions have been suppressed for the most part. So they pop through, but it's not pretty when they do. Um, and Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings have helped me a lot to calm down. Um, but how, uh, I, how do they fit in with this stillness versus river, stillness versus running thing that you're talking about? Um, and I'm talking more about his, his ideas of um, just, just stay in the present moment, right in the present moment with kindness. So where's the present moment? Is it the stillness? Is it in the, is it in the running river? Um, I wonder how your thoughts, if you could, about how to get those two pieces together. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Mary, for taking the time to sort of shape that and to ground it in your own lived experience. Because I'm guessing, I certainly did, I'm guessing a lot of us resonated not so much with the details, but the, the general point that you're making, because I think it's really right to the crux of not just wise people like Thich Nhat Hanh, this really 
powerful Dharma teacher who died on Friday, a week ago Friday. Mm -hmm. um, and they've been having a lot online. He was quite well known. But uh, all the way back to the Buddhist teachings. And it's really like, you know, the question, a, a rephrasing of Mary's comment and question is, what is the present moment and what is freedom with this life? Or what is a human life and what is freedom with that? And when we look now at our own experience, not what we think our experience is or we, what we think it means to be human, human, but in a more direct and immediate way, one way we can put words to it is there's experience being known. And the experience, that's the activity I've been talking about. So the present moment is actually characterized in this way, Mary. There's something being known. So in a sense, there are two things. There's the activity of the present moment and that it's being known. But these two things aren't really two things. It's just two ways of talking about the present moment. There's experience, which I've been characterizing today as an activity. Seeing is being known, hearing is being known, emotion is being known, thought being known, sound, whatever it is. It's a something, some experience, some activity being known. The being known part is more this empty or open space. And they're just words, right? That hopefully for us personally, point us, point the mind so that we're sensing something that's here and now that we haven't really clarified very much before. Because it, the space of knowing really transforms our relationship to what's being known. And the more that we're able to be with what's being known, the, you know, the activity of the present moment, then the more we intuit the space. Without this, generally for us ordinary human beings, we're missing the sense of open space of knowing. So our subjective experience of life is stuff is coming at us all the time. And we react to the stuff coming at us with more stuff, more activity. So I don't know about you, but I noticed when I was doing my walking practice and also with my city practice, you know, something would arise, some thought, and the heart, mind felt very compelled to react to the thought that arose or some pain in the body arose or sleepiness arose. And then some thoughts about that sleepiness. But in that experience, the mind was missing, in a way, the second half of reality, which is the space of here and now in which all this activity is happening. So generally, what, what our normal, ordinary, worldly, ignorant, just to be a little provocative way is, is it's something is being known, and it's a little bit like the mind chasing its own tail. It's reacting and reacting and reacting and reacting and never having this complementary or secondary understanding that it's happening here and now. And that space of the present moment really changes everything. So first though, to even get that, we need to just at least open to the possibility that the activity of the present moment is okay that I don't have to react to it. That's why we begin our practice often, you know, with formal sitting practice, we sit still in a comfortable way because it just simplifies our experience a little bit. We go to a quiet place, a nice place like this or in the corner of one of your rooms at home where, you know, you've taken away some of the clutter, hopefully simplified the environment a little bit. So there aren't so many triggers. And whether we're sitting or walking in an ordinary, simple way, the activity of the present moment has been simplified to some degree that we can actually be safe with it and relax with it and allow it so that we, the wisdom knows, oh, <clears throat> it's just this activity being known. 
And that's really the dynamic of the present moment, that coming together of the activity with the knowing. And then the sort of theme for today is to realize that unless we've trained, we haven't really gotten to know, gotten to trust the space, the empty space of the present moment. And it really begins to change things. So like uh, one of my teachers would say, you know, when we go this, like hearing is being known or walking is being known or thinking is being known. We really want to emphasize is being known, not the what it is, the activity, but that it's being known because that points the mind wisdom to that open, empty, space of knowing and that allows the mind to have more equanimity with the activity and the more activity with the activity of the present moment the more equanimity with the activity of the present moment the more wisdom intuits and trusts that space of the present moment and they kind of feed on each other that's really the awakening process Anything else yeah. there, Mary? Thank you. Is that what people call awareness? You hear the word awareness for this is being known. That's yeah. the same kind of nomenclature. Yeah, Thank awareness you, is used in different ways, but more and more in our tradition, at least in the early Buddhist tradition, it's kind of really this coming together of wisdom and knowing, mm -hmm. mindful awareness, awareness, yeah. Because it's we want to make the distinction between how we use the word awareness and just consciousness. Because when we use the word awareness or mindful awareness, we really mean that wisdom in the mind is um, aware of what the mind is knowing. It's it's sort of this reflective awareness, or this you know awareness of what is being known which is consciousness is more like the direct knowing and awareness is more like I'm aware that I'm knowing. Yes. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, thanks, Mary. And we have time for one or two more. Yeah, please. What's your name? Would you want to use this so we can... Actually, you know what's even better, if you don't mind? So that people are mind. You can just sit right here. We can hold this in front of you. That would be great. Can everybody hear me online? Okay. Uh, my name is Jay. Um, and uh, yeah, I have a follow-up question about awareness. Um, I was doing a daily life retreat this week um, in a similar style with Andrea Fella. And uh, she was talking about refuge and um, kind of like what we can really take refuge in. Um, and she said, we can't actually take refuge in awareness because awareness is impermanent and unreliable. You know, it comes and goes. Sometimes it's weak, sometimes it's strong. And that she was saying we can take refuge in the capacity that we have to be aware, but awareness itself is not a reliable thing to take refuge in. And um, yeah, I guess I, the, I felt really kind of sad about this because I, <laughs> I do feel like I take refuge in awareness and, you know, just knowing that it's there moment to moment throughout the day is like kind of like the, the center of my life, really. Um, and at the same time, I feel like, um, or in light of the, that talk was feeling like the grasping of it. And almost like grasping like the idea of awareness and even when i woke up this morning it was kind of like just yeah the grasping or the tightness of like okay got to be aware you know time to be aware and it just felt like this holding on and so that resonated with me what that teacher said that there's suffering in trying to hold on even to awareness um, 
So I guess my question is like, is there any refuge in awareness or where can the refuge be found or how to kind of practice with awareness enough so that it's continuous throughout the day without it being like just another thing to hold on to. Thanks, Che. That was, that's a great comment and question. And it really reveals the depth of your practice, just that you can ask a question like that. And uh, I'm assuming everyone online heard Jay okay. And uh, Andrea Fella, the person that Jay has been doing a retreat with, is uh, one of the main teachers at Insight Meditation Center in Redwood City, which is in the south part of the San Francisco Bay with Gil Fransdahl is the other main teacher there. And somebody I sometimes teach with, Andrea, will be doing a retreat at Spirit Rock in uh, June together. Wonderful teacher, uh, strongly influenced by Sadhu Tejaniya, uh, one of my teachers as well. Yeah, and it's just a great question. And uh, yeah, I agree with Andrea. I mean, awareness, this uh, capacity to be present is a kind of awareness, I mean, a kind of refuge, but not a completely dependable one. Like I'm sure you know, and we all know, it's like sometimes we're not aware. <laughs> you know, we're totally caught up, totally lost, swept away by some drama going on in our life. But awareness is like maybe better thought of, thought of as a really powerful skillful means, a powerful dharma tool that reveals, or that maybe not so much reveals an understanding, but transforms our understanding. And that is trustworthy. Like, as the habit of selfing gets eroded, worn down, the habit of personalizing everything gets worn down, that absence of selfing in a funny way is the refuge it's like who we become when we use the skillful means of awareness when we become really devoted students about how we cultivate awareness how we support it how we forgive ourselves when it goes away because of other causes and conditions that sweep us away dramas start over again build a momentum of awareness, then that erodes all of the mind's habits around selfing. You know, the Buddha talks about it in terms of four distortions, seeing permanence in what is actually changing, seeing satisfaction, what is fundamentally unsatisfactory, seeing self and what is not self, seeing beauty and what is neither be beautiful nor ugly? These sort of constructs of our mind. It's really the wearing down of these fixations on permanence, satisfaction, think thinking that, you know, if only I have lunch, then I'll be happy. I mean, lunch may be pleasant, but it's not going to be fundamentally satisfying in a lasting way. And if you think that, we'll be set up for betrayal. <laughs> you know, we'll have that nice rush when we're eating our lunch. And even before I finish my lunch, it's gonna be already unsatisfactory. Things are impersonal, not personal. Things aren't, you know, we, we have this cultish relationship with beauty or pleasantness, but it, it's really just a construct. This uh, sun, like a sunset or a flower it's when, you know, it's like we see, it, oh, it's so beautiful. But then if we just stay open to it, we realize it is something, but it's actually neither beautiful nor ugly. What makes something amazing isn't that it's beautiful versus something that's ugly. Actually, what makes something beautiful is the way we relate to it. So I think that's right. We don't, we can't take refuge in awareness, but we can, we use it. We use this wisdom awareness to transform one's understanding. And that's actually the refuge, an understanding that is empty of selfing.
that's the the real refuge. So when we say Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, it's really pointing to this transformed understanding, like a way of being a human being and really practical, ordinary sense, like being able to have relationships and to do stuff. But what has been uprooted is wrong view, like the chronic habit of framing things in terms of a separate self having an experience, a separate self who has likes and dislikes that have to be attended to, attended to. That gets uprooted and then that's the refuge. And it isn't even so much that we're take refuge in right view, a more accurate way maybe we take refuge in wrong view having been uprooted from the mind. And just like when we have really, the Buddha would teach, when we have a really, like because of certain circumstances in our life, we just have a lot of love, pure, like not contrived love, but just a real uh, ordinary, but strong sense of friendliness or tenderness. And you know, it's more of a spiritual love when it isn't about a particular person. It goes out everywhere equally in a way, right? So this is not that rare of an experience. We bump into these kind of, you could have a nice interaction with a clerk at a store and all of a sudden for a few seconds, you might have a lot of that natural, generous love that goes out everywhere equally, just friendliness all around. And if you had the wherewithal to check, you would see that a lot of that wrong view is temporarily not in the mind. And so you get a little flavor of what liberation is. Oh, this is the mind that is empty of neurotic self-centeredness or however you might language that to yourself. But the key is not so much to label it, but to get a sense of what the refuge is. But see, you need awareness to notice that, right? To kind of notice that freedom that's there because of the absence of self-centeredness. Oh. So awareness is like an essential tool and it is an inherent capacity, but like anything in nature, it comes and goes. It sometimes has a lot of momentum, especially if we keep it in mind and we learn how to value it and appreciate it, that, that actually really supports the momentum of awareness. But even really uh, powerful teachers or people who've been practicing for a long time, sometimes certain circumstances just arise in their life and they become, you know, that capacity of awareness gets really suppressed because they're really sick or a number of really terrible things have happened to them. And it's triggered a lot of the fear that they haven't yet teased out of their mind stream. So you, we see that even in people with a lot of wisdom. And you'll see people like uh, um, our teacher that both Andrea and I have studied with Saidu Utejaniya, this Burmese teacher. You know, he, he always makes that point of, um, yeah, even when we're on a good roll and we feel a lot of space in our lives, we don't know if it will last, you know, it's just here now. And uh, we wanna use that space to really see what the refuge is and what it isn't. Because even when we have a lot of momentum, there'll be little gaps where we'll lose it, you know, little vortexes of drama that will show up, you know? And it may be, it may be not toxic, like we might not go do something really hurtful or whatever, but, but you know, for five minutes, we could be really diluted. <laughs> and then we'll laugh, like we'll see it, wisdom will see it and go, oh, I was lost. I lost awareness and I was a deluded human being. And luckily I didn't make any important decisions during that three minutes, you know, from that deluded point of view, but it happens. Good. Well, thanks Jay for that. Good comment and question. And we'll have lunch. Let's see, it's uh, 1230 and we'll come back. Let's come back. Um, so we have a little bit more yeah, we'll come back at 150.
So we have about an hour and 15, 20 minutes, something like that. And people here, you're welcome to stay here and eat here if you bought your lunch or go like the co-op's not too far away, the Seward Co-op, you could bring something back and eat here. And let's spread ourselves around. There's some relatively comfortable places in the basement if it's not too cool. Community room, lobby, we generally don't eat in the, in the Dharma Hall. People at home, of course, you'll find a place to eat. And just keep the reflection going in a relaxed way. And the way to do that is just to be interested in the activity of the present moment and frame it as an activity of these six things. You know, the five physical senses have the activity of hearing and smelling and tasting and touches and seeing. And everything else is the activity of the mind. And just like, can I be okay with the activity? And remember, the activity is always something being known. And the being known half of the equation, that's that open space. The space of awareness, the stability of awareness. And we, in the, by valuing it, by recognizing awareness and valuing it, we strengthen the momentum of recognizing and valuing awareness. And the, and emphasizing the second half is what transforms the view in the mind. And mostly the view is about our relationship to sense experience. Without it getting transformed, we're very dependent on sense experience. So while you're eating, you know, it's like the activity of chewing and tasting and having judgments about what you're eating and comparing mind as you see other people eating. And, and then you'll, you'll just realize, oh yeah, and it's all being known. It's just stuff being known. Judgment, comparing mind being known. And that will change your relationship to what it is that's being known. Like, oh, it's not very personal. Brings that sense of impersonality. It's nature, not self. So it's really good to explore around food because food is one of those places where a lot of us very strongly take whatever we're experiencing personally right? We're attached to our ideas about food and eating and all of that. It's very much connected to a strong sense of self. So it's a really great place to bring awareness. So enjoy that practice. And we'll come back at 1.50 for some sitting time. Take care, everyone. I'll leave the Zoom room open, but I'll mute and uh, shut my video off in case people want to stay online, but do whatever makes sense to you. Welcome back, everyone. We'll take another minute or two to get settled for the afternoon part of the retreat. So just even as we're getting settled in, <clears throat> just putting our practice in the proper context. It's not really that much different than being a naturalist. And if we were interested in a, kind of an ecosystem and we did nothing else but spend a lot of time you know, in that particular part of the world and, and, and not with books, but simply being open and attentive and sensitive and just day after day, week after week through the different seasons, just kind of showing up in a way, the wisdom that grows, you know, spiritual wisdom, insight that grows it's different than what we often 
how we often understand like uh, intellectual knowledge where we've kind of acquired a set of facts or whatever. So in a way we're, you know, as we study the mind, study the heart, study the still flowing water of our subjective experience, we just have to hang out there. And uh, the only problem as Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, this teacher that we mentioned, I mentioned earlier, and I think someone else mentioned, he would say our only real enemy is forgetfulness. So we get, we forget and we get lost in our thoughts. It's okay, because it's gonna happen, but we can start again and we can start again over and over. So, you know, when we have that sense of presence, there can be this subtle neurotic tendency, now what? Like, now what do I do with this presence? And that's what I would call, like in terms of recognizing that, oh, that's just restlessness. Like always thinking there's more to do as opposed to appreciating that presence relaxing with that presence and maybe teasing out what's not needed, like the idea there's more to do, it's probably not a needed idea. So that can just be allowed to cease. Remember, I, I use a simile a lot from the Buddha where he gave the simile of a boat that had been, you know, done its job, fishing or whatever service the boat was in. And then during the stormy wet time of year, they pull it into shore and the sails and the riggings would just slowly rot away in the humidity and the sun and the rain and the wind. And that was the image the Buddha used, the simile for Dharma, for the awakening process. It's something is getting worn away. Something is getting worn out. And the requirement is the wrong view, let's just call it, that gets worn away, it needs to be exposed to awareness. So that's what we're doing. We're exposing the activity of our mind, the underlying views and beliefs and habits in terms of how the mind relates. We're giving it permission to be what it is, but we're adding this piece, which is to be present with it. Oh, this is being known. It's like this. So in this relaxed, simple container, that's what we're doing. So let's settle into our sitting postures now. And in honor of this, <clears throat> excuse me, very influential teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, this Vietnamese monk who died about eight days ago in his mid nineties, somebody I had the good fortune to practice with back a long time ago. But he had a set of four reflections. This is more in terms of relational practice with others, but you can use it in terms of the present moment too. So first is a statement you can repeat a few times just in your own silently in your own heart, referring to the dear ones in your life, but also to this moment to yourself. And it's this statement. Dear one or dear ones, I'm here for you. So just say that a few times sincerely in your own mind. Dear ones, I'm here for you. And in a way, it's one way of expressing our deep, valuing and appreciation of presence, awareness. Dear ones, I'm here for you, for you. 
and willing to be aware, awake, open. And to uproot the tendency, the sort of self-centric tendency, we can say, darling, I know you are there and I'm so happy. Darling, I know you are there and I am so happy. So it's like talking to the whole world which is also capable of being aware, awake, open. So the awareness isn't just located, you know, we wrongly imagine that it's here <laughs> as opposed to it's everywhere. So we say, darling, I know you are there. I know you're awake and I'm so happy. And then we acknowledge the truth of suffering. Dear one, and that could refer to ourselves or it could refer to others or the whole world. Dear one, I know you are suffering and that is why I am here for you. So again, just repeat that a few times silently. Dear one, I know you are suffering and that is why I'm here for you. And you can even change the words slightly, dear ones, this dear trembling world, I know there is suffering and that is why I'm willing to open willing to feel, willing to respond. So feel free to put it into your own words. And not even afraid of our own suffering. So this is the fourth line. Dear one, I am suffering, please help. So just that acknowledgement that this heart is capable of confusion, capable of reactivity. And just a call out to wisdom, wherever it might manifest, our own wisdom, somebody else's wisdom. Dear one, I am suffering, Please help. There's real power and wisdom in that simple statement, asking for help. Dear one, I am suffering. Please help. So I'll go through them again and save a little time so you can repeat it a couple of times on your own, silently in your mind. Just for just noticing the effects of these four reflections from Thich Nhat Hanh. Dear one, I am here for you. Darling, I know you are there and I am so happy. Dear one, 
I know you are suffering and that is why I'm here for you. And the last, dear one, I am suffering, please help. And these different, of course, there's many different ways, but these different reflections on love, one of the most powerful, efficient ways of liberating the mind from so many self-dramas, tenderizing the heart, grounding the heart more authentically in the present moment. So periodically during the sit, if you want to bring any of these four phrases to mind, just as a way of settling the heart and the inclusive space of love. Metta, this basic goodness of the heart, knows how to include the conditions of the moment just as they are. Not afraid to be open, because love understands that this is how it is now. And I care. I care enough to be open. I care enough to relax and simply feel what's moving. And in this way, love is really not that different than the stability of awareness this profound, simple, stable presence. Both have this capacity to include, to be unafraid and to learn more deeply the nature of things. So let's continue in silence for another 20, minutes or so.
So we're abandoning habits where we think we have to make some experience happen or think we have to get rid of something. And instead, just willing to know that it's like this now. This experience is being known, it feels like this. Can this be okay? This activity that's coming and going, expressing itself. Can this be okay?
Take a moment and adjust the body, stretch a little if you need to or want to. And again, it might be a nice time to ask questions or even share a little bit about any insights, any learnings during the lunch break, during walking or sitting practice, questions about the instructions. And it's, it's good to remember, I'll, maybe I'll just say something about that little Metta practice we did, of course, using different than we often do it here at Common Ground, at least, but it's really important uh, to understand that there's a lot of creative ways to orient the mind in the direction of love. And when love, the actual spiritual, like being aware, being connected with that basic goodness. In a way, it's the easiest way to remove the habits of greed, hatred, and delusion, and all the neurotic self-centered habits is to find a way creatively to recognize this capacity to be friendly, to be loving, to be open in that way, and then keep that in mind. And it it's a, a temporary, right? It's not permanent, but it is a, a very real liberation. The heart is liberated from these constricting attitudes of fear and greed and, you know, the normal, unfortunately, normal attitudes, you know, normal self centered ways that we think and view. So that was just a nice way. And I wanted to just bring Thich Nhat Hanh in uh, to the retreat today as a lot of us around the world are feeling moved by his life and teachings over so many decades. Good, any comments, questions? And don't be shy about even what <clears throat> to you might seem like a really simple question. These retreat times are just good to clarify things. Yeah, please. Do you mind coming forward? We have somebody here in the room that's going to share. Um, hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me, everyone, on the Zoom as well? Okay. So my name is Jay, um, and as I as I was. Um, in the middle of walking meditation, especially, you know, I was having trouble with stillness. So a technique I used was the motion is the motion, but the space between steps, I try to envision that as the stillness, you know, the, the, the time taken between each step is stillness. So extrapolating it, you know, to say a sitting or guided meditation. I was wondering if when we talk about stillness, is thoughtlessness a type of stillness or is, is that something to strive for? Because in some of the previous meditations I've done with you know other practitioners, they've also said like that is filled with peril because you know thoughtlessness is should not be the goal of meditation. But otherwise it's just very difficult to you know wrap my head around or mind around. Um, the difference between stillness and thoughtlessness. And I, I was wondering if you could share some, some yeah. thoughts on that. That's so. good, yeah, these are just really great because uh, that's why in some ways uh, more intellectual descriptions are less useful than these similes. The Buddha used a lot of similes and then we began the day with that simile of still flowing water. And because it, what it does with that simile, it sort of says activity is okay. Like the activity of thinking is okay. But it is true, like, like I, I was talking about at some point early in the, in the morning that it really is nice to be thoughtful 
about how to simplify our experience. Like we don't sit in a noisy place. We try to have a quiet meditation. I'll same with those of you at home. You know, you don't sit in the middle of where you're, the people you live with are on the phone or your dog is doing this and that. You try to get a little distance from a lot of that activity because it's easier to sense, to intuit what we mean by stillness when the activity of the mind and body is relatively simple, but it doesn't have to go away. So this practice of recognizing the space of the mind, the empty space of the open mind, the space of the knowing mind, the space of awareness, these are just different ways we talk about it. A simple internal and external environment is absolutely useful. But as we get better, then even in the midst of an argument with a good friend or some kind of really stressful, complicated situation, there can be the recognition and taking refuge in that space. Now, I bet some of you in the room know this to some degree, like for those of you who've been practicing for some time, haven't you noticed that you could get in an argument or even just a more friendly debate with a friend, but really intense, like you care about it, it's interesting, the mind's engaged, but it's almost like the practice kicks in at some point and it's a little hard to talk about, but it's sort of like, there's Mark, totally engaged, totally wrapped up, and it's being known. And that's just sort of interesting. One of the things I noticed is, um, you know, that really built a lot of faith in the practice in the early years, this is in the 80s. But I had, a, you know, a few things, a handful of things that were pretty dramatic. One is I, uh, someone where I was teaching uh, yoga and meditation out in Virginia for kids. It was like a yoga ashram and somebody had drowned in, um, in the lake there. And I and a couple other people pulled it, found that, you know, we walked back and forth until we found the person pulled them out. And, you know, obviously it's kind of an intense scene. And then the people that knew the person were obviously deeply saddened by the death and, we were way in the country, so we had to wait a while for the helicopter to come out. The person was pregnant, which just added even more intensity to the whole thing. And I noticed there was sort of like Mark, as you might imagine, like lots of energy, big charge, wanting to be helpful, you know, not knowing what to do, you know, all these sort of lots of activity, but there was also this sort of empty space that simply new it's like this now so there was something moving like all that emotion all that wanting to be good and wanting to do the right thing and wanting to be helpful and something that was empty and still and unmoved not moving and it's hard you know when we say these things then like you said jay we imagine that means there weren't any thoughts but there were thoughts and another example I give more often is um, I was living in the San Francisco area at the time. Now I go often to this place in Virginia to help out in the summers for the kids camp. But anyway, um, I was driving back from my sister's house over the Bay Bridge, you know, and some of you know, it's like five lanes on the bottom going from San Francisco into Oakland and then five lanes on top going from the East Bay to the San Francisco. And I was going towards San Francisco in the middle lane and there was a car stalled, which you know is night and I didn't see it until, and there's always enough traffic on that bridge that I could just immediately swerve in one of the other lanes. So I had a break, you know, full on skidding. My car slowly turns to a right angle and stops, you know, I don't know, 15 feet from the car that had stalled. And I had a stick shift, so a car stalled, I had to start it. But I, but I noticed that all through that, it was like part of the mind was doing what you would expect the mind to do, freaking out. Like, well, first of all, it's like, what the hell is that car stalled? You know, and oh my God, and you know, all those sort of 
thoughts. And then of course, in those seconds of restarting my car and all the other cars were serving around me, breaking, doing all the, you know, that whole dance. But I noticed that, you know, through that, and then after that, and after I had sort of gotten back up to speed, just that sense of all that activity, emotional activity, energy in the body, you know, all the things that happen when something intense like that shows up in our lives, and something that was still or empty or like wide open space and unaffected by the drama. So there's two things. There's the very ordinary human drama and there's something that is not moved or burdened by the ordinary human drama. And that really helps us understand what this practice is about. Because often when we get started and, and get some sense of like how to calm the body, how to settle, we think that the practice is just the continuation of tranquility. Like I'm feeling more chilled out. The mind, the thinking mind is quieter, right? So we just presume that, oh, that's just the general direction of the whole path is that it's like soothing everything out, smoothing everything out. And all of a sudden, no thought, no sensation. But that's more like a deep state of concentration where the mind removes itself from sense experience. But that's not the same as awakening. Awakening is the, is the insight, is the understanding or the way of being that, that presence, but the presence unburdened by everything that's moving, including thought, including emotion, and sometimes intense thoughts and emotions could be moving because there's nothing, there's no part of the mind that's afraid of the personality expressing itself. It's like, um, if you say something to hurt my feelings, earlier in my practice, you know, there would be very much the sense like, I, should, I shouldn't react because I'm practicing Buddhism. <laughs> you know? So it's this sort of idea that Buddhists are even and they can handle stuff. And so even though you're insulting me, and even though that cuts deep, I'm going to play it cool. But over the years, decades now of practice, I'm getting close to 40 years in, sincere, regular practitioner. You know, now it's like, I'm so much less afraid of being real. You know, like whatever, I don't want to hurt any, I don't want to hurt myself, I don't want to hurt anybody, but I'm not really afraid of this personality and the sort of tendencies of this personality expressing themselves. And so sometimes, you know, I may do stupid or silly things, but that's just nature. And sometimes I might be brilliant and sometimes I might be stupid and sometimes, you know, everything under the sun. And, uh, but there's so much freedom in not having to be, be a particular way. You know, that, that's a real heavy constriction, like I got to look like a Buddhist or whatever the ideal that we might, the mind might be, you know, holding in an ignorant way that trying to fit some mold. So that's why it's when we practice, it's sort of, there are techniques we do that do quiet the thinking mind down and it's really useful that just that uh, use of tranquility and that inner sense of well-being that we can get when the system is settling. And then we keep that well-being in mind. And when we feel good, there's just less need for neurotic thinking. So it does quiet everything down. But the point of that, besides being healing on just that emotional, psychological level, the real point of that quieting down is so that we can intuit something that's here and now something that is a capacity that's always here and now, but not recognized. And this is sort of the underlying nature of the mind or the empty nature of the mind, the, the absence of a center. There is a mind, whatever it is, absolutely. You know, there is a knowing mind. Even if you don't want to call it those words, that's okay, because words are just words. Right? There is something that's sensitive, that knows, right? Obviously, 
That's our subjective experience, right? But, but there's a lot of wrong understanding or misinterpretation that we've picked up along the way, mostly through cultural conditioning about the mind, like that it refers back to a me that stands apart. That presumption, because it's so infused in culture, so you know, perpetuated, becomes part of our way of thinking and viewing. It gets really deeply established in the mind. So it takes a lot of uh, reflection to uproot that tendency. We got a couple more. First, Freda, and then Glenda. Yeah. Um, sorry, that's my cat. Um, so, um, this is a couple days worth of, but I, it's a short story. But so there's this place that makes their own beef jerky, and I buy it and I cut it up into little pieces. And it was time to buy more, so I was. And, you know, we've got snow and the whole thing like you guys do. So you don't just go out unless you have a good reason. So on Thursday, after something else I did, I went over there and they said, oh, we don't have any. We have it tomorrow. And I said, okay, we usually have it on Thursday. And they said, well, anyway. So, so Friday morning, I called and I said, do you have jerky? And they said, yeah. And I said, do I need to set some aside? And they said, no, there's plenty. <laughs> so I get there after my other event, because I said, well, I'm not going to get there until like three or so in the afternoon, or maybe I don't, yeah, right. And I get there, and it's like, no, we don't have any more. So people, and, and the woman at the counter, she said, don't ever believe the people on the phone. Always ask us to put this aside. But I could feel myself getting angry and frustrated. And I noticed I was getting angry and I was frustrated. So I kind of let the woman know. I said, I need to be angry for a minute. <laughs> Can you, I'm sorry. And so we just talked. I, you know, she told me, I said, do you full, full time? And she said, well, I'm going to be teaching. And I said, well, you've got such a wonderful personality. But I was able to notice that I was getting it's amazing, you can get so angry over nothing at all, really nothing at all. But, you know, it was just that kind of fuse kind of anger. And I, I think it's practice that helps to, to say, oh, this is happening, I don't want to go with it, but I need to, I need it to wear down a little, I can't just stuff it. So, so that's what I did. But that, that, and then I finally got to buy my jerky before we started this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Freda. That's a perfect example. And I think a real, I mean, it, people might not be impressed with that because you didn't like manifest miracles, but I think that's a real fruit of practice is like something ordinary like that, some ordinary disappointment. And, uh, but not, not afraid of letting the anger bloom and clearly realizing that, okay, I got to keep things simple because if you had just stormed out, you might've had all kinds of things to vent your anger at, like frustrated that the car door didn't open right away, you know, or frustrated at traffic kind of, you know how that is. We find things to get angry at because we got this yucky feeling of anger. And so we have a lens, eyes that see things that upset us. <laughs> and we'll find stuff that upset us. I don't like the sweater you're wearing. You know, I don't like being angry at, you know, it's like we can even turn it toward ourselves. But just to be aware that, okay, there's an overwhelming sadness. And the thing is, with more and more practice, we know that it will peak and then it will pass. And so we don't even need a clever Dharma intervention. Oh, I better start doing metta because I got a lot of anger. We can just let the anger show its colors. And we know that if I don't feed it, if no one's feeding it, it will bloom 
it will, in a sense, fill the whole body, the whole mind, and then it'll go away. I think I've learned that a lot just in terms of my, and I think both of us have on, in my um, marriage, you know, like we're not so afraid of the other getting angry or, I mean, ourselves getting angry or the other getting angry because we kind of know how to hold space, like to hang in there without really burning down the marriage, you know, which you can do if you identify with it and start saying things out of that anger perspective you can really do yourself or relationship or your family damage but if you can hang in there knowing that it's a very strong emotion it's as real as anything but it doesn't need we don't need to be afraid of the emotion the problem is the identification with these emotions including like you only need to bury or suppress or repress something that's self if the anger really isn't self, we don't really need to repress it. We just need to make sure it's just like fire. Fire isn't inherently bad. But if you got a lot of fire around paper, then you know you got to be really careful. It's not bad. And anger, I mean, it's hard to talk about it this way because it's a more subtle way of talking about anger, but anger itself isn't bad. It's the wrong understanding of that emotion that causes real damage. Like a, uh, the Buddha uses a simile of a wildfire, you know, how it can burn down any, everything. It's not discriminating in what it burns down. Thanks, Freda. And we have time for one more, Glenda. Did you wanna share something? Yeah, um, I really appreciated your teaching today, Mark, about, um, you know, the knowing mind. I know I've heard you talk about this before, but I heard it differently today. Um, and I've been doing from Tara Brock for the last few years, the practice of um, like when I'm meditating and I notice I'm thinking um, to like send gratitude to awareness. So like have a moment of gratitude um, and then continue meditating. And today it's been so interesting to like, in that moment of awareness to kind of like turn back toward the awareness rather than turning back toward the um, experience, I guess, like the sound of the creaking floor, but turning toward whatever it is that, that knows that the creaking floor is being heard. And I've also been um, from James Barras practicing um, like the cultivation of you know, happiness is how he puts it, but like really like kind of bringing awareness to um, positive states, like what it feels like to laugh or what it feels like to love or, you know, whatever. And so like kind of in that sense, like really kind of being like, okay, well, how does awareness feel? Like if awareness is happening, how does awareness feel? And it's been really interesting today because on the one hand, it, there's this way where for me like naming something will not kind of release it but like really i don't know like i don't know how to say it but like feeling into that awareness it's like i would notice that my neck was tight and then and then really not like being thinking that oh like awareness is happening my neck is tight but like turning toward and saying like what does that awareness feel like and then my neck would sort of like naturally release if that makes sense and I guess I'm, I'm just curious, because I'm also noticing, like, as I'm interested in, like, what is the awareness or what is the quality of awareness, it's almost like I can see my mind, like, filling in um, what it is, but I, it's like, I, I almost can tell it's like a, not a, like a false mental image of what I imagine awareness to be, if that makes sense, like, I, it's like, I notice that my mind is almost creating like a screen. Like if my, I have a field of vision and some part of my mind is like, ah, oh, the field of the vision is awareness. It's not quite that, it's hard to explain, but it's like, um, I guess I just wanted to ask what the heck is happening? Because on the one hand, I feel like I can sense awareness because I 
sense its effect in the body and I can like sense some quality of it. But then when I'm really trying to ask myself, what is it? It's like, it's almost like smoke out of the corner of my eye. Like I have no idea. So I'm just curious what you think about that. Yeah, all day long, I, these comments from folks have been so insightful and more than anything really uh, kind of express the mind being curious, the mind learning, right? And that's what we hear in Glenda's comments too. Um, and it isn't so much like, and I, I'm, I know Glenda, and I know they don't expect me to give them like, oh, this is the way it is. But, um, but, it, but just kind of repeating some of what I heard, you know, the refuge can't be grasped because it would only be from the self-centered place of like, oh, that I, I feel like I'm in the vicinity of release. I feel like the mind, the heart's in a good place is relating wisely. And I want to put meaning to that so that, you know, we, when we describe to ourselves like the Buddhist teachings, of course, are concepts, they're ideas, they use words, right? And then I'll do that and then I'll have it. But, you know, it's never the word or words, it's never the idea, but it doesn't mean it isn't real. And, you know, words, concepts, ideas, they're always abstractions. And as a phenomena, like even a profound idea, self is empty, you know, that's a pretty profound idea. But as an idea, like think that thought, the self is empty, everything's changing, or whatever thought you want to think. As a thought, it's not much of anything, right? The only usefulness of a thought is if it, in a sense, uh, <clears throat> creates a bridge or an invitation for the heart to open to something that's here and now, that's not conceptual. So we have these experiences, like I think Glenda described so well, where we're really learning something about the refuge, about freedom. And in a way, it's frustrating because, you know, the egoic activity in the heart and mind obviously wants to own it. Why wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, and so there's always this, this is, you know, one of the more obvious ways this little phenomena that Glenda was pointing to manifest for us is when we start to get a little concentration in a set. You know, we're sitting, we've been practicing for a while, mind's all over the place. But over time, you know, we learn a thing or two about how to settle the mind down and we get some continuity and we start to feel the energy of tranquility building and the stillness and the, you know, less the mind running around doing, reacting to this and that. And all of a sudden, this sort of, just for lack of a better way of saying it, the ego arises like, oh, I've want, this is what I've wanted for a long time. This feels good. And it, it wants to latch on to the nice set, to the quietness or whatever it is you're experiencing in the set. And then what happens? Well, it falls apart because the cause for that settling isn't some sense of the mind owning the experience. That's a cause for stress. That's a stressful way for the mind to be organizing experience. I'm having a nice experience. I don't want to forget how this happened. I want this to last. I'd like this to get deeper or better. You know, all of those ways of framing cause it to dissipate. So this is similar to what with this more subtle territory that uh, Glenda's talking about, where we start to have a sense of freedom and we, and there's that kind of restlessness, you know, relatively wholesome, but still restless intellectual interest in really nailing down what's being understood. And so there's, you know, just to, learn how to be grateful for freedom, grateful for the capacity of non-grasping, of non-struggling, the capacity of letting go or release. 
and and we learn almost all of us we learn the hard way we do grasp the ego that habit free expresses itself and then we you know the mind experiences the tension that comes with that self-centered framing and we do that hundreds probably thousands of times until learning sets in deep more deeply like this is not the way so we there's a great line from one of Ajahn Tanasaro's teachers, uh, another one of the Thai forest masters, who said, you know, when you really start to experience freedom, this is a paraphrase, when you really start to experience freedom, it doesn't bother you that it isn't personal. <laughs> you know, initially it's like, I wanna be free, but actually that's not true. We just, the heart wants freedom. And the, the thing is that that experience of awareness, wisdom awareness, it has the nature to dissolve ignorance. So when the mind is able to orient around awareness, that wisdom awareness, that open space, any knots, any self-centered tendencies in the mind tend to unwind in that space because they need fuel any of the self-centered dramas and the fuel they need is wrong view, like taking the knot personally. That's what keeps the knot knotting, <laughs> getting entangled, right? Getting tight. So when knots are met with that wise, loving presence, then knots have the tendency to unwind. And when there's a somebody who wants the knot to go away, and then there tends to be that sort of, maybe there's a little unwinding and then there's more winding and you know the endless frustration of thinking we're onto something, but never really getting anywhere because there's still a sense of a somebody who's gonna do the unwinding. And that wrong idea is the, the base cause for the winding up the entanglements themselves is that wrong idea of self so hopefully that's helpful and related to what you were experienced glenda and i really appreciate both freda and glenda's comments and other people earlier today so let's do some walking we'll come back have one more shorter sit and then some closing thoughts and reflections from the group so I have a little bit after three central time. Why don't we walk for 20 minutes? We'll come back, be ready to go before 325, okay? But have a nice walking time. Feel free, of course, to use that time as needed. Take a couple moments to get settled again. Come back to our sitting posture if you're not there already. So for this last uh, 15 minute or so set, I'll give us some traditional instructions 
And then let me just review what we'll do so it will help and I, I won't have to talk as much. But the first part is just having confidence that our heart is capable of being loving and good. And so just that confidence in the heart's goodness itself. And then noticing that, that quality of kindness or friendliness <clears throat> has the very nature to expand and to wish well. So there's a kind of net like light has the nature to shine out in all directions. Metta has this inclusive quality and it's not like you have to do something to make that quality of goodness, friendliness, be welcoming or wishing well. It's more that we as a practitioner recognize that expansive quality all the way to it's that sense of it being boundless, meaning the direct sense, subjective sense is that the whole space of my mind, my heart, my body has the vibration of love. There's nothing that I'm bringing to mind, nothing I'm imagining or thinking that isn't touched by the friendliness. That's what boundlessness is kind of pointing to. And then from there, we'll, I'll give some instructions, traditional instructions, just to be aware of the space of the mind, the empty space of the mind, and to learn to abide in that open, still, silent space. And, and then even there, as activities arise, it's so much easier to see any activity of the thinking mind or whatever, as just nature. We don't have to be for or against anything. Okay, so let's settle in. <clears throat> And uh, for some of us, at least, an easy place to rediscover that this heart is, in fact, good, capable of goodness, is just to simply realize I care about this life, I care about the life of this body right here and now, the resilience of this body. Let me just feel the body. And as if we're allowing this very sweet, this very sincere smile toward the body, wishing well, this willingness to include the whole body in the vibration of friendliness and love. It certainly doesn't mean that the body is perfect. It just means that the heart cares. Cares enough now, in this moment at least, to show up, to be willing to feel whatever's here to feel, nothing excluded. Cares enough to be unafraid. May this body be at ease, happy and at ease through all the twists and turns of life. And right here, we notice also the sensitive heart, the heart that cares for the body. And we can even care for this sensitive heart, this tender, good heart right here, right at the center of things here. I care about this sensitive heart. I care enough to be close right now. And I care enough to be willing to feel what's here to feel in the heart to soften, to relax, 
to allow the heart to be the way it is. And may this goodness of this heart continue, increase, never end. As if the heart, the good heart itself is like this beautiful light shining in all directions. And we notice how it fills the body, fills the space of the heart and mind. Just the glow of goodness. Learning to trust this expansive, generous goodness, including everyone, all beings everywhere, all things in all ways, exalted, boundless, a goodness that is free of ill will, free of fear, not holding back. And we're learning to trust and rest back in this goodness, this boundless, generous goodness. The Buddha's words, I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with this goodness, above, below, all quarters, everywhere and every way, I will abide. Free from hostility, free from ill will, I will abide. Nothing is untouched by this love simple, pure, and good, the heart that cares and wishes well all around, like a beautiful smile, nothing is left out. And we simply notice the vast space of this goodness, this all-inclusive space at the present moment. And appreciating how wide open and vast and peaceful and empty of fear, empty of neediness, having the flavor of wholeness or contentedness, ease, just appreciating this vast silent stillness. Now we'll just take five or 10 minutes and doing our best to trust and rest, abide here.
not having to attend to the activity of the moment. The more the mind intuits the empty space of the knowing mind, the more wisdom understands that activity is nature, not self. Given any Dharma thoughts are nature and not self, just the activity of causes and conditions empty of self.
and for the last minute or so in a relaxed way, just being curious, what would it be to fully trust and fully relax and abide in the empty space of the present moment? Not afraid of any activity whatsoever. And adjust if you need to. And uh, we're going to take the last 15 minutes or so just to give people a chance to check in. But first, uh, time for one question, maybe either from the in person group or the online group related to this last sit or just related generally to the practice that you want to bring up. Anything in the room here? Anything online? Good. Well, some of you remember from the olden days, the pre COVID days, when we would do a day long, especially in person, we'd We organized the group, have a big oval, and everyone would at least say hi, and some people would say a little bit more and share just what the learning was from the retreat, things that you'll take home, or just generally in your practice, some of the deepening. And we've heard some great comments already today, but we have time for maybe five to 10 people just to share a little bit about what are you learning in your Dharma practice? that you're willing to share with the wider group. And for those in house, if you wouldn't mind coming to sit, you don't have to sit cross-legged, you can just sit on this and I'll hand you the mic so that the people online can hear you. And of course, the people in the Zoom meeting, you can just unmute yourselves. And again, especially people who haven't had a chance to speak yet, just some learnings. Um, Anybody willing to go first? It's always nice to say your first name and maybe where you're from. Anybody online want to start us off? What are the learnings from today? I'm uh, really, I just was really struck by this, this idea of still moving. I thought it was something else because there's something in another tradition about meditating on moving mind. And that's sort of what I thought thought that phrase meant and I see that it's uh, quite different and really profound so I just really appreciate your teaching on that yeah thanks Jean and thanks for getting us started who'd like to go next why don't we do a few people in the zoom world and then we'll do a few people here in the room in person Other folks just checking in about some learning, some deepening, 
some clarity that's coming. Hi. Um, one thing that struck me was um, the space, what you need to give in a conversation, whether it is um, it's like instead of pulling yourself into the conversation, whether it is an angry conversation or I, I don't know, I still need to get more clarity on it, but I really like that concept of having that space around you so that you are not totally, you're, not in a reactive mood for the moment. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And and let's take that cue and actually do it even for these last 10, 15 minutes. Like, can we really, I mean, in this weird place where we have people in house and people on Zoom and, but can we be aware of the space and also intimate and responsive to the activity, like be a real human being in relationship with each other, but also keeping in mind the space, the empty, silent, still space of awareness. Thanks for that last one. Who would like to go next? Maybe one or two more people from our Zoom community, if there are some. Yeah, hi, Mark. Hi, everyone. I don't have a long thing, but while we were practicing today, um, it just something occurred to me that I often relate to freedom without me really, I wasn't really aware of it, kind of like an item, a thing, like a grand, fantastic thing, but still a, th a thing. And then uh, when we uh, meditated on space and the walking, I just uh, physically or somatically felt like freedom is much more uh, like an activity, even though activity might be too sharp of a word. But Definitely freedom is much less of a thing. It's not a thing. It's not a thing. Yeah. And we can see it with, you know, remember, th they're not really two things, the space and the activity. They're two facets of the same thing. And we want to get to the place where we can sense the freedom in both. In the space of knowing, sensing it's empty of drama. In the activity, it's empty of friction. And we have that sense sometimes, you know, we even have sort of commonplace words like being in the flow, right? You're playing a game, basketball or whatever it is, dancing. And you can be in the flow because there's no friction, self-centered friction in the activity of dancing. You lose the self for a little bit, right? Like there isn't the self overlord. <laughs> What's that? sort of silly, it's not really silly, but new agey poster, you know, dance like no one's watching, especially yourself. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Eva. Yeah. Who'd, like, who'd like to go next? Yeah, um, just a comment early on, I think Jay said, uh, I was struck by just that sadness of not being able to count on awareness of being the thing. Um, and then talking about refuge, and I think, I don't know, I think you were saying, you know, like not relying on tranquility to be the thing or be the refuge, and, you know, and, and I re remember feeling like, oh, yeah, I feel sad about that, too, and, and just, like, understanding, it's so hard to put into words, but understanding what the refuge is and feeling it, and also, you know, I've been practicing a lot with metta and thinking about what gets in the way of love and you know that it's there but there's just stuff in the way of it and yeah so just using both those things as a, a refuge the 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 metta as a refuge but also 
knowing that sometimes it's just not clear to me. And it was also useful when you said, um, you know, that that knowing when you're in the middle of a conversation or, you're, or an argument and you know that there's this part of you that's getting it or there's a part of you that's spacious even though something's going on, that really struck me also. So thank you so much. Mm. Thanks, Maria. Really great to hear your voice. Who would like to go next? Anybody else from the Zoom community willing to share with the whole group? I uh, appreciate it, and I wrote it down when you said, um, when you really start to experience freedom, it doesn't bother you that it isn't personal. And, um, you know, in this last sit, I was thinking about how many times I've been um, practicing and thinking, I'm really bad at meditating, or <laughs> I'm today I'm really good at meditating, you know, and just kind of it, I liked the idea of like, just letting none of it be personal because then it's okay if you have a day where it's hard to you know, not think about every single other thing under the sun when I'm sitting. <laughs> so I just, I really liked that. So thank you for, for sharing that. Thanks, Erin. Thank you. Anybody else in the Zoom community? We have time for one more at least. And you are next <laughs> in the room. So let's just see if there's someone else from the Zoom community before we turn to the in-person group. Um, you know, I, I came today because I was this really deep knowing that I needed a day of just stillness. It was so delightful for the theme of <laughs> still water um, to meet that. And um, I had a, a, a sit where I could really feel into the fatigue of my body and it felt sleepy and I felt sleepy, but by the same token, it was so clear that awareness was here and holding the sleepiness and holding the fatigue and it was bright and it was crisp and it just like held it. And, you know, that happens to me periodically when I sit and I'm always surprised by it. And, and it just speaks volumes to this capacity to really listen to the inner voice and the body. And, you know, it's always trying to tell me what I need. <laughs> and uh, it was just another example of that for me today. So thank you. Oh, thanks, Nancy. And that could be an encouragement to all of us because sleepiness obviously is a common thing. And to just do what Nancy suggests, to realize, like, don't have a problem with the sleepiness, but realize there's awareness that knows the sleepiness. And the awareness isn't sleepy. Sleepiness, the body and the mind, you know, that aspect of the mind might be sleepy or heavy, but the awareness like a mirror is unaffected, awareness is unaffected by what it's knowing. I just wanted to say that what stood out for me, what was a helpful point in the practice was that, uh, Mark, when you said um, refuge is an understanding away from selfing, that to me really, it resonated in my practice as I find sometimes I'm, though I'm being mindful and, or I think I'm being mindful, I still feel like I'm identifying with what I'm being mindful about. So that particular pointing was very um, helpful for me. It, it helped me uh, with the uh, witnessing of the space and stillness. So thank you for that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's really deep. Let's turn to the folks inside the Paul here, we have a couple minutes. Be nice to hear from a few folks, just any learnings. And if you don't mind coming up so I can hand you the mic and people on the Zoom meeting can hear you well. What kind of learnings did you notice today? Take homes. Yeah, please, come on up. You don't have to pin it. You can just hold it near your mouth. 
some of the things I've been thinking about um, lately, what, what I've been meditating, um, is really about letting go of fear. Um, I, as you know, Mark talks a lot about is um, you know the aversive nature, and um, something I've been thinking a lot about is how most of the aversion I have is really rooted in fear. And so even today, you know, coming into a group meditative set set setting is um, not something I typically do. I usually listen online. Um, so I feel a lot of uh, fear surrounding other people or even like public speaking. So like in this morning's meditation, um, thinking about this idea of um, fear being neurotic and like, oh, these people are thinking about me or or you know there's some kind of preconception we have about uh, other people um, there was just this moment I was able to kind of set it aside and then turn the neuroses away from myself and um, kind of just really think about loving kindness and that's it's a fraught term but just really tried to radiate out friendliness to everyone in the room and it just made everything dissipate and that was really powerful for me so thank you that and we have time for one more person what i really appreciated here is kind of going back to the knots that you talked about and just at home and through work can be kind of easy to it's easy to be much more aversive to it and kind of ignore it and kind of go about your day not acknowledging it and while i wouldn't say it dissipated by any means um it was nice to kind of come back and acknowledge that it's there and kind of feel a deeper relationship with it versus you know at home kind of knowing it needs attention and then just kind of doing the things that ignore it so it was nice to come back to that and thank you, everyone. So great. I appreciate people willing to share a bit and wish we had more time to hear from more of you. Yeah, and, and please just finding each of us, finding our own way to keep the reflection going in a very natural way, not in an unaffected, uncontrived way. Because the last thing we want to do is like put on another identity of you know, going home on Saturday night and having to be the Buddhist or something like that. And so what is just being interested? Because we're not interested in the concept of space awareness. We're interested in something that's real here and now. And uh, that keeps it simple, you know. And the words are just to help us get interested in what's here and now, not anything more than that. And I think most of you know, but in case you're new, everything at the center is offered freely. Of course, it happens because the community has been generous and supportive. And you're welcome to be part of that generosity. But part of that generosity means you're learning how to receive it as a free gift. No strings attached. Because it's really the gift in a sense of all the other generosity that's happened previously. So really do whatever you need to do to learn how to say, oh, that, that's nice that everything is offered freely. So then when you give back, you're not giving back because you did a day-long retreat. You're giving back because it makes you feel good to give back and you want to be part of something good. And that's true if you volunteer or you just send your good wishes or you contribute money to kind of make the place happen. I put the uh, link to the section of the web page on the chat so those of you online who want to learn a little bit more how the center operates, you can look there. And people here, you know, where there's an iPad, if you do want to contribute and a donation bowl and some information on the, on the donation table that if you want a little bit more background about how the center operates, or you can talk to me too. So great to be together. So I'll be doing the day long retreat. I'm forgetting now if it's next Saturday or two Saturdays. And I know next Saturday, Ramesh Sairam is going to do his mindfulness and physical pain workshop. Um, I think Shelly right now is scheduled to do the day long at Shelly Graf at the end of the month. And uh, lots of practice opportunities out at the retreat center. I know Cam was just out there. She, he was our kitchen manager for a retreat that happened recently. But I'll be leading practice. I think Bo's going to come out. Um, 
I think it's the 22nd through the 27th, something like that. So it starts on a Monday night or Tuesday morning. You can arrive and stay through Sunday. There are a few slots left and a couple for the March practice periods as well. And I'll be out at the retreat center all of April, and it will be open for people to come out for a whole week or a weekend, depending on what part of the month. So that information should be available in a, in a week or two um, if you need to plan ahead. Great. Thanks again. Have a nice evening, everyone.